Hey there. Well, I shouldn't do this. I, I'm going to do a Hebrews 2 teaching. I've got a wedding today of all things. It's weird. It's uh, a Monday wedding. And I really need to learn a song for it. So I need to kind of make this short. Um, <clears throat> uh, so we're now coming to chapter 2 finally. And uh, we're dealing with the first warning in Hebrews. And I just wanted to give talk a little bit about that warning. Um, you know, remember that people are scared of this book because they think it means that they think that the warnings in Hebrews imply loss of salvation and judgment for believers. And a lot of people get around Hebrews by saying, well, that's written to the Jews. Um, again, written to the Jews is code for people can be justified by works. Okay. It is not a grace argument. It is a works argument clothed as grace by saying we're living in the dispensation of grace. But prior to that, Jews were justified by law and will be again. The problem with that argument, it's called hyper-dispensationalism, um, is, number one, it flatly contradicts Paul and his clear statements in Romans 4. Uh, but the problem is, is if a Jew could be justified by works, why can't you? Okay. And it always leads to works righteousness. There's no security in that at all. How do you really know that you're in the church dispensation? How do you know that, <clears throat> the, uh, and I'm not saying it's true, but how do you know that the folks about who, who understand the difference between the church and Israel aren't wrong and the church will be here during the tribulation and actually we're in the day of the Lord? Well, if the hyper dispensationalists are right, then we're living in a time when it is works and grace. You don't have a way to know for sure that you are in the body of Christ versus the little flock. I'm a Jew by blood. They say that there was a group of people that this letter was written to Jewish believers who belong to the little flock. Um, now, no, we who believe in Christ, ever since the resurrection of Christ, have been baptized into Christ and have put him on in which there's no Jew or Greek. Um, there's not a coexisting separate nation, uh, a separate group of people that God's dealing with according to a different so-called dispensation. Not that there aren't different dispensations in the Bible, but grace has been common all the way through. It's always been justification by faith apart from works, okay? So when someone says, like, their answer for James 2, or their answer for Hebrews, or their answer for John, 1 John, is, or Revelation, is that's written to the Jews. Just know that on the surface, they seem to be making a grace argument but actually they're arguing for works righteousness because if anybody could have ever been justified by works and if righteousness could come through the law, Christ died in vain. No one has ever been justified by works. And it comes from a basic failure to understand what the flesh is and why Jesus died. Okay, and it's a real big problem. It's, it's totally heretical. So we're not avoiding the book of Hebrews and saying it's for the Jews, but nor are we applying the warnings in Hebrews to believers in the church as if you could lose your salvation or that God's going to bring vengeance on you and cut you off. There is a sense in which Hebrews was written to the first century Jews uh, about, apparently, about seven years before Titus Aspasian, um led the armies in and took the city apart brick by brick to get the gold and it was the worst siege in Israel's history even worse than the days of uh, the Babylonian captivity um, and everyone there perished the only people that uh, the, if you were not there you were lucky if you were not if it was not a feast day uh, you were lucky you know um, or if you'd heard, believed Jesus and heard the prophecies of Daniel and Jesus in Luke 21, which prophesied the destruction of uh, Jerusalem, the desolation of Jerusalem and Israel 
and the times of the Gentiles beginning, uh, which is according to Daniel's prophecy in Daniel 9, 24 through 27. The next step was that the after Messiah was cut off, uh, he would be, present himself as king, and then he would be cut off. After the city was built, rebuilt, um, a certain number of days, Messiah King would present himself, and then he would be cut off, executed, uh, but not for himself. And then the people of the prince that shall come would destroy the city and the sanctuary. Uh, the city and the sanctuary would be destroyed again. And then desolations are determined on Jerusalem for an indeterminate amount of time. Well, Jesus elaborates more on that in Luke 21 and says, yeah, because you missed the day of your visitation, which I think was in Luke 19, when he presented himself on the cult to fulfill Zechariah 9.9 on the very day that could be calculated from Daniel 9.24 through 27, uh, and he was rejected by the leadership, he said, Jerusalem, he wept over Jerusalem and said, I would long to gather you as a hen does her chicks, but you would not. Therefore, the things that make for your peace are hidden from your eyes. Uh, and you will not see me again until you say, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And Paul confirms this in Romans 11 where he says, uh, There's a mystery. Partial blindness has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles be come in. And then all Israel will be saved. They will, they will one day see him who they've pierced and mourn for him and be reconciled to him as a nation. But as a nation, they were judged. And individuals who were saved after the resurrection of Christ by believing in Jesus, became members of something new called the body of Christ, which is not Jew or Greek, okay? And uh, it's Christ. But um, the judgment that he pronounced was that all the blood of the prophets from Abel to Zechariah, who you slew between the altar and the temple, would be required of this generation. And uh, he was telling that na nation's present leadership that they would suffer the vengeance of God on the, on the blood of the prophets. Now, Hebrews makes mention in Hebrews 12 that we've come to Zion and there's blood that speaks better than that of Abel. Abel was the first prophet. And he was the first martyr, and he died for the testimony of Jesus Christ. Um, and his blood cried out from the ground, according to Genesis. And his blood speaks today for vengeance. But Jesus' blood speaks of something better for us, which is our justification. But the vengeance spoken of in Hebrews was real and imminent. In fact, the... Jewish believers who would have been reading this epistle uh, again this was written about seven years prior to the destruction of the temple according to most history stuff um, w had fled Jerusalem knowing that judgment was pending okay and remember in, in Luke 21 he said when you see uh Jerusalem surrounded by armies know that its desolation is near that is not talking about the abomination of desolation Standing in the holy place by spoken of by Daniel the prophet, which is referred to in Matthew 24 as the trigger event that begins the great tribulation. That's at the end of the age This is the beginning of the times of the Gentiles a phrase that Jesus used uh, and the desolations of Jerusalem which was going to come to them as a judgment for rejecting Christ and missing the day of their visitation, and it's a fulfillment of Zechariah either 12 or 14, as he cried, and uh, they would not hear, so they cried, and I would not hear, but I scattered them throughout the nations, and then Ezekiel 36 talks about how they'll be scattered throughout the nations, uh, and that they would leave the pleasant land desolate, and the nations would blaspheme even the name of God, saying these are the people of God who have gone out from the land. Okay? Um, Hold on a second. So, um, in Matthew, in I'm sorry, Luke 19, there's that statement where Jesus says, Pray that you may be counted worthy to escape the things coming upon the earth and to stand before the Son of Man. 
And that's actually still talking about the siege of Jerusalem. And according to, I think it was Josephus, uh, the historian who, who said, or was it later historians? I get that mixed up. Somebody was saying, no, I think it was Josephus, it was Josephus who said that um, there were signs that accompanied the destruction of Israel, uh, the, with, such as earthquakes and sun turning dark and uh, lots of somewhat apocalyptic supernatural signs um, because prophecy is in patterns. It's foreshadow and foreshadow and foreshadow until the final fulfillment. So Antichrist, I mean, Nimrod is a type of Antichrist. Uh, Nebuchadnezzar was a type of Antichrist who built a statue of himself that was 660 feet tall, 66, 666 feet tall, and everybody had to worship it at the point of death. Um, Antiochus Epiphanes, who... Uh, uh, what was a type of Antichrist who set up an, a, a pig in the Holy of Holies during the time of the Maccabean Revolt. Uh, and then uh, Titus Aspasian and his 70 AD desolation of Israel is a type of Antichrist. And each time there were signs that apparently that accompanied that were apocalyptic. And because of this, there's people that confuse Luke 21 with Matthew 24 thinking he's talking about the same thing, and he's not. And that's why they say all of the prophecies were fulfilled in 70 AD. Uh, and we're in the kingdom now, the kingdom's in our heart, and now we're taking over the earth like leaven. You know, they misapply the parables, and it's a mess. It's called amillennialism and allegorization. But actually Luke 21 and Matthew 24 are not talking about the same thing. And escaping, uh, standing and standing for this, pray that you escape the things that come upon the earth. There are two instances in those passages in Matthew and in Luke where the Jews, at the time that they see these things, are supposed to be escaping and literally running <laughs> for their lives. In Luke, um, they're to watch for the siege of Jerusalem. And they're to know that the desolation of Jerusalem is nigh. And in Matthew 24, they're to watch for the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place, which is Revelation 13, which is the beast with his image and the false prophet demanding that everybody worship it. And then they who are in Judea are supposed to flee to the mountains and don't let, don't even look back and remember Joe's wife and our Lot's wife, all that stuff. Uh, because Antichrist is going to be chasing them, literally. And then God's going to protect them um, somewhere in Basra. Uh, everybody says it's Petra. I don't know. But all those are according to Old Testament prophecies that are enumerated in great detail in Obadiah and Nahum and uh, um, Isaiah and Daniel. The Revelation is not just spiritual stuff because it's in signs. Revelation is signified communication that refers to Old Testament scriptures where all these prophecies are spelled out in great detail. Like a puzzle, you put it all together to see what's really going to happen. But uh, it takes a lot of study. But we have to take these things literally and Luke 21 is literal. And the Jews at this time of writing Hebrews the Jewish believers knew that the vengeance was coming on Israel. Okay, the nation. Romans had already been written and was circulated. And Paul had already explained in his doctrine in Romans that Israel had been cut off as a branch, uh, that partial blindness had come upon them until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in, and eventually all Israel would be saved. Um, but you are not supposed to consider yourself an Israelite as a believer, other than you could be an Israelite citizen, a member of the nation, but not consider yourself as part of that branch anymore. You've been cut out and, and uh, baptized into Christ. And in spiritual terms, there's no Jew or Greek. Um, you're a member of the body of Christ. And all the privileges and the position and the security and the blessing of being a member of Christ 
uh, applies. Okay, so here he says the first warning in Hebrews. Therefore, we ought to give more earnest heed to the things we've heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape? If we neglect so great a salvation, which at first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed to us who heard him, God also bearing witness with signs and wonders and miracles and gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. And then he goes on to talk about the kingdom. The, the, the great salvation is the world to come being subject, not to angels, but to man. Okay? Uh, but there's this warning that many people read it and think, okay, I thought I was saved. But you're saying that if I neglect so great a salvation or drift from the things I've heard and let them slip, uh... That there's a punishment for this? Am I being punished? Are, you know, does God punish believers? Um, like, he does he deal with us the way he dealt with Israel? Uh, so there's that. Then there's people who fabricate uh, doctrine that says, well, you're saved as long as you keep believing, but if you ever stop believing, as if such a thing could really happen, uh, you lose your salvation, as if eternal life is not eternal. Um, you have to, and faith is a work, basically, of, of a, of a surrender. It's another kind of, it's lordship, salvation. Um, you can lose your salvation. So, so then there's the hyper-dispensationalists who say, well, this is actually for Israelites, Jews, and so it doesn't apply to the church. Oh, so you're saying there is a group of people that is justified by works and can lose their salvation. <laughs> um, okay, none of those things are true. He's speaking to New Testament heirs who are secure and should be fully assured. The, the purpose of Hebrews and the purpose of all the apostolic epistles, uh, and I say apostolic, I mean people who were genuinely apostles, <laughs> um, was to affirm people in the faith and to assure them of what they have in Christ and to let them know that they have every reason to believe that they're safe in Christ because they have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Uh, so anyway, um, what is he talking about here? He's saying... If the word spoken of angels was steadfast and every transgression of disobedience received a just recompense of reward, that's talking about the law of Moses, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? Is the gospel a new law of Moses that's even higher and more severe than Sinai? No, he's not saying that either. <laughs> he's saying that if you forget, if you grow numb... If your senses get dull and you get so pressured by your countrymen and by your old traditions and what you used to know that you let go of the apostolic teaching you've received uh, and let it slip from your mind and we find you back at the temple and then we find you our synagogue then we find you going with your family to Jerusalem to the feast. You are in very real, present, physical danger that you, how will you escape? Okay, now he mentions this a number of times through the epistle. And this is kind of new to me, the this realization. I was wondering what he was talking about. Because in uh, Hebrews 10, when he's, I saw this when we were dealing with the pastors who were telling you that God was going to kill you and take vengeance on you if you don't go to their institutional church and make sure you pay your tithe. And they were using Hebrews 10 and talking about trotting underfoot the Son of God, and they called it sinning willfully. <laughs> um, was it Hebrews 10? Yeah, and uh, if we sin willfully after we receive the knowledge of the truth, there remains no sacrifice for sin, but a certain fearful looking forward to the indignation, fiery indignation, which shall devour the adversaries. 
Well, what? For a believer? Because he's saying, uh, let's see, that, um, the, how, what what judgment do you think we will be considered worthy of if we trod underfoot the Son of God uh, and count the blood of the covenant by which we were sanctified an unclean thing? Now that means you have been sanctified by the blood and you did believe. You're a believer. You're not losing your salvation. What is he talking about? Well, there's this assembly of people outside the camp, outside the gate, outside Israel, outside of that system that's being persecuted and at the same time being tempted to backslide back to Judaism by the fact that even in the churches, the churches themselves are being overrun by Judaizers who are saying that in order to be saved, or maintain your salvation, or perfect the flesh, and be sanctified and blessed, you have to keep the law and go to feasts. That's what he deals with in Galatia. The first letter Paul wrote, I think, other than Thessalonians, was about you are seeking to observe feasts and signs and seasons and moons and the beggarly elements as if you're a slave back in Israel before the adoption happened. Under the schoolmaster of the law? That's what that's what the Judaizers tempted them to do. Because the Judaizers wanted to parade them back to Jerusalem and say, look at what I've got. I've got a bunch of people who are zealous for the law. I'm really bearing fruit. They're doing it for the praise of men and to glory in their flesh. Um, but there's a very real danger that you may end up in the siege, <laughs> the vengeance. That It's literally that practical in Hebrews. If you don't believe that prophecies are literal, then you don't have a way to apply it that way. But if you understand what Jesus had said and what was pen, pending as far as the judgment that was coming on Israel, then you understand the urgency behind the warnings. Okay? Um, it's not about, it, now that's the other thing, is Hebrews is not actually talking about eternal salvation when he talks about salvation. He's talking about rest. Rest is not eternal salvation. Rest is the enjoyment today of what you have in Christ because of your eternal salvation. And Hebrews is all about entering into rest today, which is contrasted to dead works. When we're talking about that, you know. That you're not trying to buy from God what you've already obtained as a gift in Christ. But you're actually resting in and growing in the, the assurance of, the knowledge of, what Christ has provided and accessing God boldly based on it. Um, and that's giving you more strength and more confidence. Uh, so that every day your rest is growing deeper and richer. But there is a rest held forth as a promise in Hebrews. Now that's the second aspect of this warning. Um, that there is a promise of entering rest. There's a, there are warnings in Hebrews about a promise being held forth of entering into rest and some people not entering in. Even to the point where he compares them to Israelites who fell in the wilderness. Now, is that possible for a believer? Yes, because some of the people who fell in the wilderness, many of the people, were genuine believers in the gospel. They believed the promise of the seed of the woman, the seed of Abraham. They believed that they were heirs for the seed's sake, and they knew that without the shedding of blood, there was no remission of sin. They knew they were sinners, and they knew that only God uh, could justify them, ultimately. But when it came to their actual living before God, um, they made it a matter of works and thought he wanted them to enter the land by taking it themselves in their own strength. And they mixed law with grace. Um, instead of realizing that only Christ can bring us into the land, 
they said, all that God has said we will do at, at Sinai. Uh, and then when they sent the spies to check out the land, they came back and said, yeah, the land is good. But there's Nephilim in there. We can't take it. Forgetting that God is the one who delivered them from the Egyptians. And he didn't require anything from them then. He wasn't going to require them to take the land now. It was going to be God working through them. Um, and this is a picture of how we live the Christian life. We don't live it with any expectation on ourselves, making a vow or a commitment about what we're going to do. We live it based on a realization in faith of what Christ what, what Christ is and what he's going to do and what he has done. I'm sorry, what he has done and brought us into. And that realization brings us into a place of rest where we cease from our own works and uh, as God did from his and we actually enjoy the presence of God. Today it means enjoying the presence of God. In the Old Testament it meant enjoying the good land. The good land is a picture of our enjoyment of the presence of God. It's a picture of the unsearchable riches of Christ available to us as the milk and the honey and all the riches in the good land. You know, when they were in the wilderness, all they had was manna and the, 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 uh, they did have some doves for a while. Uh, but it was a really dull, dreary place. They were on the milk of the word, so to speak, the elementary principles, the doctrine of Christ. They knew there was something called the good land. They knew they were heirs of the good land. But when it came down to how to enter in, they didn't understand a life of faith. Now, there were people among them that were a mixed multitude and simply did not believe. And they fell in the wilderness because of various judgments as unbelievers, like the sons of Korah. Okay. Um, however, the entire generation, including Moses, was prohibited from entering the land. They died in the wilderness. God waited for them to die out for 40 years. It was an 11-day journey. Moses is a justified heir who believed, and yet he didn't enter in. Um, and others who were justified heirs who believed did not enter in because of unbelief. Okay? And once God had decreed, you will not enter in, there was no more arguing about it. The, even if they, even though they did believe later, I, 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 I think they repented um, and taught their children because their children were geared up and ready to go when it was their turn to enter the land. They knew. We dress ourselves up and present ourselves to Joshua. He's our picture of Jesus and he will take the land. We'll follow him and it'll be supernatural. And they did it by faith. Well, where did they get that? They were trained by their parents. But their parents died in the wilderness as a judgment for their unbelief because God wasn't going to bring them into the good land if they didn't know how to possess it. Okay. Now there is a string of warnings in Hebrews about the urgency of entering rest um, that is strong. Okay. Now rest is contrasted in Hebrews to an evil conscience which is seeking to be justified or seeking to be cleansed or seeking to be perfected by something other than Christ. And as we said in the message, this won't be in this playlist, but two days ago I did a message about how all the works in the holy place, and we'll hit all those when we get to it in Hebrews 8 and 9, all those works were a picture that the priest did, all the sacrifices and the ordinances and the washing. We're not a type showing us how we live our Christian life. They were an anti-type showing us the intolerable burden of trying to, and the futility of trying to maintain your spiritual life apart from Christ. And that there needed to be a sacrifice made that could actually bring them in. And those sacrifices which they offered continually could not perfect their conscience um, because if it did, they would have been ceased to be offered. But while they were being offered, it was just a continual reminder of sin and declared or manifested um, that the way into the holiest was not available. None of them could enter into the fellowship with God. The holy place and the wilderness co uh, co 
they uh, are paired in Hebrews. So there's three places. There's Egypt with the Red Sea and the Passover. And then there's the wilderness. And then there's the good land with the Jordan and baptism into the death of Christ. And the Jordan rolls back to Adam, the city called Adam. Okay. And there's three places related to the, uh, and, and that good land is called rest. And that they're making a journey in the Old Testament from being unsaved to actually entering rest, the enjoyment of of everything that they've been given because they're heirs. When they left Egypt and passed through the Red Sea because of the blood of the pa Passover, they were being, in a picture, baptized into Christ, but baptized into Moses after being justified by faith, by putting the blood on their doorposts. They were counting themselves as heirs of the promise. And God had told uh, Pharaoh through Moses, let my people go out for a feast to me. They, he didn't say, let them go out to the wilderness to wander around. He told them, let them come out to a feast. Because he had a feast in mind for them, the riches of the good land, which was the inheritance for Abraham's seed. And by faith, they were identifying themselves with the seed of Abraham, who is Christ. You're not a seed of Abraham if you're not related to Christ. And only Christ can bring you into rest. Um, which is the enjoyment of your portion as an heir. Now, when they entered the wilderness, they were heirs. Justified and destined for the good land. But they didn't make it in. They died as heirs, not enjoying their portion. They will enjoy their portion in the land in resurrection. They'll be risen into the land, according to 30, Ezekiel 36. The Jews actually expect that. Their graves will be opened, and they will sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom at the wedding feast. Uh, that's The kingdom's going to be amazing. Okay, So they're all still heirs, even though they died. So what we're talking about is a present-day salvation, a present-day enjoyment of salvation. When he says, today is the day of salvation, today if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart and enter his rest, he is talking to believers. Because uh, their experience was a picture for us today who actually have the ability to enter into rest, each of us and all of us. It's held out as a promise as today for believers. The enjoyment of Christ, the unsearchable riches of Christ, and his presence and blessing, okay, is held forth as a promise. But it's by faith. That means not by sight, and we walk by faith, um, not by what we feel. Even if I don't feel it, I don't say I'm disqualified and go back to other things to try to qualify myself. And that's what they were doing in the wilderness. It's a continual wandering around trying to qualify themselves as heirs by law when only Christ could bring them in. Um, now those three places, the good land, I, I'm sorry, Egypt with the Passover, the wilderness and the good land, um, correspond in Hebrews with the tabernacle, with the outer court, where the bronze altar was, where there was the sacrifice of the lamb for their sins. And then the holy place, which is where the priests stood to minister and maintain the showbread and the lampstand and the incense altar. And then there was another, and there was a curtain separating the holy place from the outer court. And then there was another curtain called the inner veil separating the holy place from what was called the holiest of all. And the holiest of all was also called rest. The holy holiest of all and the good land are both called rest in Hebrews. There's a rest for the people of God. And the holiest of all has Christ, the high priest, the finished work of Christ, and the presence of God. Uh, and, if, and, and it seems so barren in there. Right? It seems so empty and dark. It's just this little curtain, curtained off section. Well... 
beyond it, there is the good land with all of the riches. And that's why when I wrote my Hebrews book, oh, I wish I could pull up the picture. Um, I had someone do the cover where Jesus as the shepherd is leading the sheep through the tabernacle. And you can see the lampstand on the left side and the showbread on the right side. And Jesus in front of them. And all the sheep have crowns on. And he's leading them past the rent veil. And beyond the rent veil, you can see this huge open pasture with a beautiful blue sky and a golden sun. Okay. The holy place is an entrance into a wide open space for us. The holiest, I'm sorry. Uh, and I always say that, you know, Jesus said it's a narrow gate, but a straight road. But he didn't say the straight road was narrow. <laughs> you can't fall off the straight road. It's actually very wide. Uh, it's the narrow gate that's narrow. But once you get through, it's a huge open space of the unsearchable riches of Christ to enjoy. And there's an enjoyment of Christ that seems just beyond reach for so many people. They know about it, theoretically. Okay? They know that Christ is supposedly the living water. And he said, come to me, all you who are thirsty, let him come to me and drink. Out of his innermost being shall flow rivers of living water. He said that on the feast day. Uh, feast of Tabernacles, which is a type of the good land. It's the day of the, a, a celebration of their enjoyment in the land, in their booths. Uh, a rest. The inheritance, okay, for the first time since the beginning, now, because of Jesus Christ, we have access to what the Jews didn't. The way into the holiest has been made open through the veil of Jesus Christ, but there's only one way to enter in, and it's faith in the gospel. And the Jewish believers, as we are, this is where it does apply, are tempted to wallow in unbelief rather than exercise our faith in the gospel to come near to God based on faith in the blood of Jesus Christ, we would rather wallow in self-pity, bitterness, bitterness about life situations, and, um, and all of that comes out of the need to seek, you're still seeking to be justified. You don't, you have not rested in the finished work of Jesus Christ. It does not mean you're not saved. The Passover got you saved. It means you're in the wilderness. And there is an experiential difference between being in the wilderness, wandering around with Sinai, overshadowing it, the law, and your promises to keep it, knowing that you can't, <laughs> and the condemnation that ensues, and the anger it produces, and the frustration at knowing that there's a good land just over the River Jordan that you probably will never see. Okay, that's the plight of a believer who's wandering around the wilderness or wandering around in the holy place trying to maintain the showbread and the lampstand and the incense altar, which is a picture of our spiritual life. It's our soul life. Trying to maintain your own spiritual life and maintain your soul. You can't, nor are you supposed to, because Hebrews says that as long as the outer tabernacle or the holy place stood, it showed that the way into the holiest was manif not manifested. Once we get into the holiest, the whole tabernacle system disappears, and it should be gone from our mind. And that's what it means to have your conscience perfected from the consciousness of sin, and to be brought near in full assurance of faith. And while you're being brought near, according to Hebrews 10, in full assurance of faith, your heart is sprinkled from an evil conscience, and your body is washed by pure water, which is a service provided to you by the high priest himself, Jesus Christ, who's within the, pres within the veil, who, according to Peter, through the knowledge of himself, is ministering an abundant entrance into the kingdom. What's the kingdom? For us, it's a righteousness, peace, and joy in the Holy Spirit. It's the enjoyment of what we have as heirs. Now, that's not talking about like the word faith charismatics that say, you're going to be rich, and you're going to say whatever you want, and that's going to happen, and your enemies are going to bow before your feet, and you're going to be the head and not the tail, and everybody's going to love you. 
you'll be the president of every company. You start out at the janitor, you keep believing, and you'll be the president. No. In this world, it's Satan's world. And Hebrews addresses that, that, that we don't see everything yet subjected to man. It's still under Satan's authority out there. And we're still out there, according to the flesh. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned for, with glory and honor. And he sees at the right hand of God, and he's hidden. And our life is hid with Christ in God, according to Colossians 3. And our Christian life, with its enjoyment, is a hidden thing. It's not something God really puts on display for the world it's hidden in Christ and will be manifested in that day. That's why 1 John says the world, we are the children of God, only the world does not recognize us. But we know that when, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he appears, we shall be as he is, for we shall see him as he is. And everybody who has this hope in him purifies himself even as he is pure. And that hope that's in us is the hope of glory. Christ in us, the hope of glory. Which Paul refers to, as the living hope in Hebrews 6 uh, that brings us as an anchor for our soul that brings us into the presence within the veil. It actually captures our soul and brings us into the presence within the veil. And it's our soul that wanders in the wilderness. Our soul is our mind, will, and emotions. And that's where we seek to be justified and get angry at God and complain about our situations and it's that that needs to be divided from the Spirit by the Word. In Hebrews 4.12, talking about the entering the rest of God, talks about the Word, which is living and sharper than, uh, than any two-edged sword, able to pierce to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint marrow, even to the um, thoughts and intentions of the heart, for nothing's hid from him with whom we have to do. The Word is Christ himself, and he's there not to judge you, but to help you be free by showing you the motives. Why is it that you're so pressured by your countrymen to go back to Jerusalem? Yes, you're afraid of what they think, but the root of it is you're afraid you're not justified and you think you can't access me. You're in unbelief, like in the wilderness, where they said, well, yeah, the good land's good, but I can't take it because you think it's on you to do. And it's paradoxical because on the one hand in Hebrews, there's all these admonitions not to miss the opportunity to enter his rest. While it is called today, and you hear his voice today, don't harden your heart as they did. and don't. This is how you can provoke God and grieve the spirit. And I've dealt with believers that will not enter rest. I know they're justified, but they argue and argue and argue against the grace of Christ and argue for works as the way to live the Christian life. And I can feel the anger and the frustration and the grief from the Lord. You can feel it. There is a way to grieve the Spirit. It's not as you think. It's not just by sinning. It's the willful sinning against the blood of Christ by counting an unclean thing and trotting him underfoot and going to something else rather than Christ for justification um, in unbelief saying well, there's no such thing as enjoying Christ and enjoying the feast and enjoying the holiest and you're too heavenly minded to be of any earthly good I don't believe any of that stuff back there anyway I never seen it because the veil is over your eyes you don't see back there because you're still reading the Bible according to law um, but it's paradoxical because you can't do anything about this if this is your condition. <laughs> and yet there's all these warnings in Hebrews about your condition to, to not let it govern you. All you can do is acknowledge that you're in error and keep coming forward by faith in the blood and say, Lord, I know I've got unbelief. I know I've got these issues overcoming me. You are my Joshua. You're the only one who can take the land for me and bring me in. That's all we can do, is surrender ourselves exactly as we are. And that's what the living word does to divide between soul and spirit and see the thoughts and tensions of our heart. It's not so that you can make some kind of vow. It's so that you can cease from all your striving and your works 
Because if you read Hebrews um, any other way or any other book of the Bible and think I, it's trying to tell me something to do, you're going to miss the point. It's The word is to get you to see that even your best intention to do the thing you want to do is wrong. <laughs> There's... You, there is an enjoyment of Christ available to believers. There's a victory in Christ um, where you are not plagued with sin consciousness and you're not afraid of God anymore. You're not living under condemnation. And you also are not afraid of things happening in your life. You're not afraid of your weaknesses being exposed anymore. You're not afraid of his discipline. You know, uh, I had a conversation recently where someone was like, I wouldn't have let this person into the chat. I knew, and you didn't seem to know, you know, and it all blew up. Yeah, it blew up in my face, and I should have seen some things, but I didn't. But I trust that the Lord is sovereign. He orders my steps, and he ordered the steps of everybody else involved, and he taught us all together. And he's even working for that person's good, too. He's their high priest, too. I, I'm, I'm pretty relaxed about it. I'm not going, woe is me, if only I had chosen a different path, if I had done it differently. Because I am more and more just yielded in, in the knowledge that everything is taken care of for me. I'm less and less stressed about my spiritual life. I still get stressed about some finances stuff and wedding stuff and marriage stuff where I'm learning to see Christ in all these areas. And don't believe anybody who tells you they've already entered rest. Because Paul said, I'm learning to be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, which is out of the law. That which is out of God and based on faith in Christ. I'm pursuing, I've counted all things as lost, the excellence of the knowledge of Christ, and I'm pursuing to know him and be found in him, uh, to know him in the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering. And he said, not that I've already attained or have already found it, but I pursue. And one thing I do, I forget everything which lies behind and I keep going. And anybody who's mature is going to have this kind of mind. That's Paul at the peak of his ministry saying he had not attained to the kind of rest that's held out. There is a rest promised to the people of God that we haven't tasted yet. I think it has to do with the refreshing that I've kind of had some visions of before we go. That there's a group of people who are going to go forth into Zion with singing with crowns of everlasting joy on their head. Not because of a supernatural experience so much, like a revival, but because Christ has been applied. Christ has been, we've grown in all things into Christ, who's the head, and we've learned to deal with Christ in everything. And we're no longer seeking to be justified in anything other than by faith in him. And we've seen, we've come to rest in him no matter what happens to us. Uh, there's a joy there. And I think there's a whole group of people just before the Lord comes that are going to be so perfected in their conscience that they're going to be running towards him. In contrast to many people who will not enter rest, who are offended, who are intoxicated, who are playing with idols. They are playing with idols. The rapture bingo, rapture idolatry, uh, seeking some sort of escape, but not believing they're even worthy for it. And staying at the milk of the word never leaving the elementary principles of Christ, wandering around in the wilderness, trying to figure out how much is required of them to make this thing bearable. Uh, you know, how, trying to synthesize works and grace, law and grace. You know, I know I'm an heir, but Sinai is there. Didn't you see the mountain? Don't you remember the Ten Commandments that came down? And we promised we would do it. Well, the end of that is to see that you died with Christ. And to pass through the Jordan. You don't get to go into the good land unless you pass through the Jordan. It, all of that was for you to see your death with Christ. And until you see that you've died. And that the law, you died to the law. And the law is unprofitable for righteousness other than to point you to your need to Christ. And until you see that only Christ can bring you in. And you actually look to him. And you're actually interacting with him. And you're actually believing and coming forward to God based on faith in the blood. This is not just, now I'm not going to be a Calvinist here. This is not just mental, mentally agreeing with a doctrine. I've talked to people who know this doctrine up and down, but will not enter rest. I know all that, but I'm just so miserable. Why does God let this happen in my life? Okay, you don't know all that. 
<laughs> you've cons you've agreed with somebody somebody's teaching, but have you really thought it out? When's the last time, instead of complaining to God, or making some deal with God in your prayer life, you came to Him and preached the gospel to yourself and used the gospel to go into the holiest by faith? Do you even know what I'm talking about? I have a whole playlist called Preaching the Gospel to Yourself. We have to preach the gospel to ourselves is a means to kickstart our fellowship with the Lord. And it works. You, There's no reason for you not to be enjoying something of Christ today, no matter what your situation is. Um, so that's the warning in Hebrews. We just keep in mind, no, he's not talking about losing your salvation. He's talking about not entering rest. Uh... And in this verse in particular, he is talking about we need to give earnest heed to the things we've heard so that we don't slip from them. What happens is that you, once you, if you let go of the good land and the rest and, and pursuing Christ as even a goal, and you go, I'm just going to settle, I'm a Christian, I'll be content to just go to heaven and be the trash guy, you will be in law righteousness. You can't help it. And you will be under condemnation, and you will be bitter, and you will be miserable, and you will always be wondering why this happened to you. Is God punishing you? It's, you know, and you'll be wandering around in the wilderness or in the holy place. You can't stop because you've got Christ in you. You can't get away from Him, and you'll be miserable, and you will slip back. We've seen a lot of people slip back once they've seen what the grace of Christ is and see that it's a judgment on the flesh and they have to say, I'm, didn't, I've died with Christ in order to enter in and only Christ can bring me in and there's nothing I can do to get there. He's got to bring me in. They balk at that and then they let it slip and before you know it, they're back to rapture idolatry uh, and rapture bingo and they're back with the miserable wolves again and they're all offended and bitter. You know, um, now, if you were one of those people, today it's on YouTube. You just see their channels all flock together and they do, you know, hit videos on people and they are on each other's walls. But they're not enjoying rest, okay? But back then, you'd get together with the Judaizers and you'd all get together and go to the feast in Jerusalem, okay? And what if that was the time that God decided, this is now I'm bringing in the judgment? How would you escape? There'd be no way to escape. You're there. And that's a physical reality for the Jews in Jerusalem. Um, and a, a need to keep Christ before you back then as a real tangible, I'm sorry, as a real alternative to a tangible judgment. And if you let that slip because of your own personal frustrations, it is true that your life degrades, you know, uh, because you can't get away from him, so you're going to just be angry at him. Uh, and if you do that, if you go that route, you tend to run with other people that don't have your best interests in mind, and they will take you, and this is what he talks about in John 15, you know, that if a man does not abide in me, if a man doesn't abide in me, men gather them. And throw them in the fire, they're burned. It doesn't say God throws them in the lake of fire. It says men do. Is it the lake of fire? No, it's the burning of persecution and the trials that come because of false teaching. Which end, all end up being a discipline from God anyway, if you're genuinely one of his believers. And you will come back. But it won't be a pleasant journey. you know. And there is a possibility of being a Christian and never entering in the good land. Never tasting rest. And I know people that it's just like... Unless God did some sort of absolute miracle to transform the way they think, they're impenetrable. And this is where, you know, the Calvinists are so wrong because they say that salvation is just totally predetermined and grace is irresistible. You've never tried to minister to anyone trying to get them to enter the good land who's genuinely justified and qualified to be there but will not because of their own unbelief. And you haven't seen how much it grieves God. Uh... And of course they haven't, because they haven't entered in. They're out in the, you know, the reason somebody's a stalwart Calvinist uh, that's militant about it is because they themselves didn't enter rest. And they got carried off as spoil with this system of doctrines um, that's an argument uh, to give their conscience some rest 
that is doesn't give you rest. It pretends to, but it's not the same thing as drawing near by faith in the blood and actually enjoying the presence of Christ. And you say, well, how do you know they're not doing that? Well, look at their videos. <laughs> look at the things they say about believers. Look at them. They're totally in the flesh all the time. Okay. Uh, so, there's if there's no food coming out, it's because there's no food going in. And they're not eating from the same table we're eating from. So, okay, I had to go. I got to get ready for this wedding. Um, take care.